Uh, so next up, we have our keynote with Python Steering Council members Pablo Halindo and Thomas Wouters. Uh, unfortunately, our other three Python Steering Council members weren't able to make it to PyCon this year for various reasons. Uh, you know, COVID, babies, et cetera, et cetera. So all, all very <laughs> understandable reasons, um, but they are certainly here in spirit. I did not have time to print out their faces, but that absolutely was my intention to have them sitting in these chairs with them. Uh, so just um, imagine little cutouts of their heads sitting here alongside. Uh, so we're just gonna give them a moment to get everything hooked up and then we'll get started. Seated, so no. It's good. All right. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the probably most boring keynote of the conference, uh, at least my part. Uh, Pablo and I are two fifths of the Python Steering Council, and we're going to talk about the Steering Council. Thank you. Uh, so here is what we're going to talk about. Uh, the Steering Council, uh, highlights of the year, just a couple of highlights of the year. Then Pablo is going to give a very exciting talk about what's new in Python 3.11. And then we'll have a little uh, pre-recorded Q&A session. Uh, the questions were asked uh, via the internet over the last two weeks. So what is the Steering Council? Uh, the Steering Council, as defined in PEP uh, 13, originally PEP 80, uh, 16, is in charge of Python, the programming language, and Python, the uh, C Python, the implementation. It replaced the BDFL, Kido Van Rossum, and yes, that is how you pronounce his name, uh, when he retired in 2019. We are uh, supposed to govern by consensus, so we're not uh, authoritarian control. We listen to the core developers, we listen to the community, and we make decisions we think is best uh, in all of that. We're also charged with fostering the community and fostering the core developers, making sure the volunteers can all do their work, uh, all of that. And then also we make the final decision on Python enhancement proposals, uh, at least uh, the ones that we don't uh, delegate to certain individuals who have better experience or better knowledge than, than we do, and who we trust to make those decisions. We meet weekly. Um, and I say this because uh, we take this seriously. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we have to go through. We meet for an hour and a half every week and we fill that hour and a half talking about things. And then we also do some other work besides preparing emails, communications, etc. And just to make it very clear, the Steering Council is separate from the Python Software Foundation. The Steering Council is the technical direction of the language and the Python Software Foundation is the community, the fundraising, the grants, this fantastic conference, uh, infrastructure like PyPI. Uh, there is a lot of overlap. There are uh, core developers on the PSF board of directors, including me. And uh, there are board directors like me and former board directors like Brett on the steering council. Uh, we also have a very good work, had a very good working relationship with the former executive director, Eva. She attended our weekly meeting, uh, not a voting member of the steering council, but very much part of the process and uh, providing a lot of support and keeping the lines of communication with the Software Foundation uh, short. Uh, 
so we can spend money, which I'll talk about later. Um, Eva left the PSF last year after 14 years of service. Um, we have a new executive director. We haven't quite established the same relationship yet, but I'm sure it will be fine because I loved it. Uh, for those who want to keep up, up to date on what the Steering Council does, we publish monthly updates on GitHub. Uh, we also send them to discuss.python.org, which is the discourse website we use. And if you have any questions, you can always ask us personally at the conference, in email, or you can send an email to steeringcouncil at python.org. So a little bit of the steering councils we've had in the past. Like I said, this was established in 2019 because Hiro wanted to retire from being the one person in control. But as you can see from the first steering council, he didn't quite abandon us. He was part of the first steering council, creating a little bit of continuity. Uh, the year later, we had uh, Nick and Hiro step down, and uh, I came in and Victor Stinner. The year after that, Pablo replaced Victor Stinner. Victor stepped down, I should say, and Pablo replaced uh, Victor. And then last year, uh, Carol stepped down. Barry, who is probably somewhere in the audience heckling me, didn't get reelected, and we had Gregory and Peter uh, in their stead. Now, I put the company names up there, um, we have a conflict of interest policy, no more than two people from the same company. Uh, if, for instance, Google acquired Microsoft, you never know, uh, <laughs> one of us would have to step down. I also put it up there because uh, even though we have a nice turnover, and I colored the slide so you can see kind of the spread in years of service on the steering council, and we have a spread of experience as core developers. Uh, Brett, Greg, and I have been core developers for 20-some years. Uh, Pablo and Peter are more recent core developers. Uh, we are still five white guys working at tech companies, so it's not exactly diverse. Uh, we are spread out over the world. We have uh, a very diverse set of opinions um, to the point where Occasionally, we have discussions in our weekly meetings, uh, specifically Pablo and I, and then when I come down from my office, my wife asks who I've been fighting with. I just speak very loud. <laughs> and it's all good. I mean, we, we work together very, very well. It's just we have passion. Um, the di I mean, the diversity is a reflection of uh, the core developers. Uh, we are all core developers. It's not a requirement for steering council members to be core developers. I would love for a non-core developer to be on the steering council. Um, but the people who vote for the steering council are core developers. So there is a, a trust issue, an experience issue. Um, a lot of the decisions made by the, by the steering council are very technical, so we want the technical knowledge. But there are also a lot of social things uh, we're looking at ways to spend money, uh, ac acquire sponsorships. Those also require other expertise. So uh, I, it is something I hope we can improve as the core developers in the future. Um, here's a terrible picture of us. Um, on the top from uh, left to right, Pablo, me, Greg, and the bottom, Peter and Brett. I apologize for the picture that makes me look young. Uh, it's very old. So, some highlights of the year. First of all, bugs.python.org was migrated to GitHub issues. <laughs> this was the result of years of planning, years of discussion before the years of planning, um, and then more than a year of work uh, by Ezio, uh, which was funded by GitHub, by donation from GitHub and with support from GitHub. There were a lot of GitHub engineers involved as well. Uh, in the end, to, to try and get it the last, you know, last mile done, uh, we included Ukash as well. And it was completely finished on April 10th. Um, there's still some cleanup to be done. Uh, the current state is that bugs.python.org is frozen. I don't know if a lot of people have used Roundup. I thought it was great but it's not GitHub issues, and it doesn't have the network effect and the community knowledge that GitHub issues has, as well as the integration with the rest of GitHub. 
all old issues have been moved, uh, including comments and other metadata. It was a lot of data. Um, it took uh, three days to migrate. It was originally going to take seven, but GitHub managed to uh, provide some speed ups. All new issues have to be created on GitHub. All the changes have to be made on GitHub. It's all on GitHub now. Uh, all the documentation was updated, as far as we know. Uh, you may have missed some. We have a new FAQ on uh, the migration and the effects of the migration. And we're still uh, ironing out the last couple of things, but the bots and the workflows have all been updated. As a funny thing, we did these slides before we knew that the GitHub migration was actually done. So we assumed that it was going to happen. <laughs> We were never quite sure. Um, other news from the last year, we hired a developer in residence. Um, this is something that the steering council has been working on since 2019, so since before my involvement. Uh, we originally wanted three developers in residence uh, that we were going to fundraise for in 2020, um, but then the pandemic happened, and we weren't quite sure what the PSF, uh, what state the PSF would be in. Um, Last year, Google came to the PSF and wanted to provide a significant donation for a good project, and we convinced them uh, very easily that it would be a good idea to hire a developer in residence to work on CPython, um, a full-time core developer. Uh, Lukash is a long-term core developer, a release manager for 3.8, 3.9, and he gave a very uncontroversial keynote at, uh, on Friday which I was in agreement with, just for the record. Um, so it's hired, the position is hired by the PSF, it's funded by Google this year. Meta has already provided funding for the next year, which starts in July, so we're good for a little while. Uh, but obviously, we want this to continue in the future. Um, and while it's, it's managed uh, by the PSF, because you need to make sure that people have everything they need uh, to do the work, the direction is set by the steering council. We've asked Lukács to do a number of things, including the GitHub issues migration, uh, and he's been also been working through issues and pull requests, mentoring, and trying to figure out the best way to have impact. Um, he's also been keeping the community up to date on his blog. Other news of the last year, um, multiple efforts to speed up CPython. This isn't entirely a new thing, but a lot of things came together last year. Uh, Microsoft has a faster CPython team that's been churning out uh, changes to speed up CPython. Instagram uh, released Cinder. Uh, Sam Gross came to Core Dev with a plan to remove the global interpreter lock, which would allow parallel threads to execute Python. Uh, that we have Piston, Pigeon, all kinds of projects that have been going for a while that are still going and providing insides and patches and experiments. A lot of this work is experimental. Um, not all of the improvements will land. Uh, there's a lot of communication that needs to happen as well. There are trade-offs to consider. But we already see good improvements in 3.11, which Pablo will talk about, and uh, there is going to be uh, more to come. Awesome. Who is excited for 3.11? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover um, a bit kind of the things that you can expect for 3.11. We still have one week, so maybe some brave person <laughs> will propose some gigantic pep. So sorry if that's missing. Please don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm also a release manager, so better, better not give me more work. But um, I'm going to cover like briefly what is there. If you have um, more interest on some of these topics, you can read the what's near 3.11 or the PEPs in particular. So let's go. So the first exciting thing is the faster CPython project. Um, so here you can see, it's not important that you can read the different things, but what, what you're seeing here is the different benchmarks that we have on the official benchmark suit, like um, showing 3.10 against 3.11. 3.11 is the orange one, uh, 3.10 is the blue one. The interesting thing to see here is that, you know, like uh, bigger bars are worse and smaller bars are better. So a lot of these benchmarks are, have been improved. This is the biggest improve in any patch release that we have done. So in any minor release, sorry, uh, which we are super exciting. How this will translate to your application, as Mark Shannon likes to say, it depends. 
um, you know, give us more benchmarks so they can appear here. But we are super excited. We are packing very uh, interesting optimizations, and we are uh, we are very hopeful that uh, you will enjoy them. Um, of course, uh, there has been some uh, interesting consequences of this. We have been working very hard to try to fix like third-party projects and whatnot that have been affected by some of the most internal changes. Uh, so it may take a bit more to, for some projects to support 3.11, uh, but uh, we think that uh, in total it will be worth it. Um, so yeah, faster C Python. Everybody is excited about that. So what else? Uh, so we have more error messages. I'm not going to talk about all of them in particular, uh, but I'm very excited to say that in 3.11, most of these error messages that you can see here, um, those are like a specialized syntax error, have been contributed by the community. So uh, before I've been working on them, but a lot of people have been very excited about these things. And many of the ones that you see here, like for instance, like function arguments with two stars, something like that, have been proposed and even contributed by members of the community. So you, you could do that, it's very simple. Uh, you can watch the recording of one of my talks to know how to do that. Um, but yeah, we, I think uh, everybody loves like better error messages and we are going to still pack those in 3.11 and even more in 3.12, so stay tuned for that. Uh, something that we have also that we are super excited about is PEX 657, um, which has this boring uh, name, include fine-grained uh, fine error locations in tracebacks. Uh, so what this pep is about is, um, for instance, uh, here you can see like a traceback of an exception that says, uh, here, non-type object has no attribute x. And this is because like something uh, in this big formula here is none. And the problem is that in 3.10 and before, it was not possible to know which one of those things was none. But with this pep, we're super excited because now we can show you this instead, in which we can point to you immediately that, ah, it was this guy here, the one that it was none, which is very cool. Uh, you can see other examples here, for instance. Hey, nice. <laughs> Uh, this is my favorite, actually. You can see here, like, imagine that you have some big JSON uh, with a lot of, like, you know, levels, so you are accessing a bunch of things here, and the problem is, like, yeah, non-type object is not subscriptable. Not good, right? But look at this beauty. Now it's telling you, yeah, it was this guy that is not subscriptable. <laughs> nice. And also, who, who doesn't uh, like uh, dividing by zero? Dividing by zero is bad, right? We don't like it. Uh, but now it's even better because like, it will tell you which one was the one that was divided by zero with this nice arrow here. Um, so much better debugging. You don't need to attach a PDB or anything. You can uh, know this thing from the traceback. So we are super excited about this one. Um, more cool stuff. So for instance, um, we have now exception groups and exception style. This is a very interesting one. Um, so right now we have this new API that still needs documentation, so if you try to look for documentation, we, we will get there. But the idea is that it's, it's something that will work very similar as how Trio nurseries work. Uh, so in Async.io, you can now say, uh, I'm going to start a task group here with a context manager, an asynchronous context manager, and here you can create a bunch of tasks. And the whole idea here, although it has more interesting semantics, but the main idea here is that um, the, the task group will basically wait until these two tasks finish. Um, and you can, and, uh, you can handle correctly cancellation, so if you cancel some of these tasks, it will behave as you expect and it does in trio and things like that. And this is very, very exciting because like a lot of people have been waiting for this. Uh, these semantics have proven to be super, super interesting from the trio project and we are bringing them into C Python. Interestingly, to provide nice uh, like interoperability with the interpreter, this requires a big change, which is uh, the actual pep that is, uh, that is here. Uh, the reason is because uh, this task over here, like T1 and T2, are going to run um, concurrently, right? And both of them can raise exceptions. So we needed a way to communicate to the interpreter that some piece of code can raise multiple exceptions, not only one. And this is uh, what this pep is about. So now there is this uh, new exception called exception group. Uh, here I'm raising one of them. And the whole idea of this exception group is that you can have many exceptions inside. For instance, I'm, I'm adding here one value error and one index error. And for instance, if you raise these things, you will see that now we have this nicely formatted traceback code. Uh, so if, if you, this exception reaches the top level, it will tell you, okay, uh, someone throw this exception group, and inside this exception group, you know it was a value error and an index error. This is very important because uh, this will allow you to handle cancellation and many other things that happen with, with exceptions group in a nice way. And to provide very good interoperability with interpreter, now we have this, this extra keyword called accept star. 
So now you can write this kind of code, which uh, at the beginning looks a bit funky, but it's very easy to understand. The main idea here is that in normally in an exception handler, only one of these will execute, right? If you throw an exception, it just happens to be a spam error, so the spam error handler will execute. If you happen to be a foo error, then the foo error handler will execute, so forth uh, and so on. So, but in, with except star, because it's made to handle exception groups, then multiple of these things can happen. So for instance, if you throw an exception group that has a spam error and a foo error, then both the handle for the spam error and the handle for the foo error will, will trigger. This will allow you to handle, uh, for instance, an um, um, exception group that has cancellation and other things. So for instance, you could uh, use uh, some of the information to stop a database or to um, you know, log the exceptions, whatever you want. Um, the actual motivations and why this is useful is very well written in on the pep, so I really encourage you to go there and read about it. It reads very, very nicely, but we will also obviously put some examples in the documentation so you don't need to read all the technical document. Uh, but you know, it's a very small change, but if you write a sync IO code and you are uh, been using Trio, uh, we think you are going to love this version on a sync IO. And we are very excited for you to try it out. Um, so we have, um, so what, sorry, this is the same thing. So we have a lot of type improvements. So uh, the first thing that we have is the self-type. This is a small one, but it's, a, it's very useful. So the idea is that if you have a function here that returns an instance of a class, so for instance, in this class, in this uh, example, uh, this method uh, called set scale is returning an instance of the class shape. So before, normally, when, if you type annotate this code, instead of self here, you will put the, the name of the class, which in, th in this case is shape. Uh, this, unfortunately, doesn't play very well if you now subclass shape, because if you call set scale for a subclass, MyPy or other type checkers are going to freak out a bit because they are going to think you are returning shape here instead of the subclass, and it's not going to play very well. But now you can basically type annotate this kind of code with self, and it will do what you expect. If you use this thing for a subclass, let's say, I don't know, circle, uh, when you call set scale, it will think that it's a circle as you expect, and also you don't need to type the, the name of the class over here, which is nice. Um, some more interesting typing improvements is uh, variadic generics. Um, so the idea here is that um, you can now do this kind of code over here. So when you are annotating a generic, you can now put like an unpacking star and some type variable. We have a new one that is called type bar tuple. But the whole idea of, of the star shape is that now you can assign to this thing arrays that have multiple uh, dimensions. For instance, here, I am creating two uh, types for the height and the width of an array, and I can use this shape to match an array that has height and width, but I can also do this thing if it has like four of them. So the idea is that this, this thing over here can support assignment to things that have multiple, um, multiple dimensions over there. Uh, interestingly, this pep has some consequences on the language. For instance, now you can do this, which before it was, um, before it was illegal. Uh, the idea is that now you can unpack in, in get items. So for instance, I can uh, define here a bunch of indexes, one and two, and I can unpack those indexes here in this, uh, uh, when I'm accessing the array. This is equivalent to basically adding uh, zero, one, two, and minus one. And if you have an iterable, it will basically unpack the iterable and access the index. This is not extremely useful. It's kind of a side effect of the other thing, but we think it's actually consistent with the language. Like there is other places where we allow to do these things and it's, it's just for you to know that it's allowed. Uh, but it's, this is not the actual feature. The actual feature is the one before. Um, we also have um, uh, literal string types. Uh, and the idea here is that, for instance, if you have, um, uh, let's say you have a, a function called execute that is going to run some query on the database. So the idea is that um, if you annotate the query itself with this literal string type, uh, the type checker will complain if you pass a string that is not a literal. For example, the second string here is a full literal string, it's not formatted, so that is good because it means that um, no data from the user or from weird parts of the system that will allow SQL injection can make into my query. But if now I go and format my string, either using f-strings or format, uh, this is not considered a literal string, it's considered a regular string, so executing the query will error. There is other uh, uses for this, um, but uh, the security kind of uh, thing is, is uh, the most interesting one that is written in the pep, but you can go to the pep to know uh, how, how this uh, change can actually be useful. So apart from typing improvements, now we have Tomo Live in the standard library. This was, uh, this took a while, <laughs> but now we have it. Uh, so now you can open, uh, you know, Tomo files, uh, and you can also um, 
uh, do the same thing with the strings. We don't have dumps, so if you are thinking about the, the JSON module, uh, you can load and dump JSON. We only have loads. Uh, the pep actually describes why you can only read toml and not write toml, because writing toml is, is kind of a mess, um, especially because people expect like consistent formatting and whatnot. Uh, but now you can use this thing. If you have PyProject.toml, you can directly read it with, uh, with Tomel in the standard library in 3.11, and you don't need third-party libraries. And basically, that's it. Uh, what we have for, for 3.11 so far. Here is a lovely photo of the Cordova Spring, uh, sorry, of the Language Summit this, uh, this year at PyCon. Um, and uh, this is uh, not only the Cordova team that attended PyCon, but also a bunch of people that were in the, in the summit. And we are very excited for you to try 3.11. I think it's going to be uh, the best release ever, but I'm also the release manager, so you know what I'm going to say. Um, so we hope that you like it. So I mentioned we put up a Slido on the internet two weeks ago um, to assemble some questions because we didn't think with COVID rules it would be a good idea to hand around a, a microphone. By the way, Pablo and I are on stage, unmasked, close together. Um, we're both vaccinated, uh, boosted, and we both had COVID. And still, I'm only comfortable doing this because everyone followed the rules, is wearing masks, and uh, everyone is safe. So thank you. So we put a Slido on and started asking uh, questions of people. And I don't know how many of you saw yesterday, saw uh, Peter Wang's keynote, but um, this. I don't know. Okay. Did we? Oh, there we oh, go. You go. This was the first, uh, the most upvoted question. Um, what are the SC's plans to put Python in the browser? I, we don't need the plans anymore. Um, <laughs> Peter's taking care of it. Seriously, though, this is one of those things where it feels like something the Syrian Council should care about, um, but we're only, you know, we're only making decisions on proposals that other people bring to us. We're not driving the development of Python at this point. We probably could, especially if we had more uh, core developers in residence, but at, at this point, uh, we are not making uh, these decisions. So I'm really glad that uh, other people are doing the work and we're we're very happy uh, with Christian Hyman's work to uh, include WASM builds in CPython and creating a supported platform, but we're not the ones making the decisions or doing the work. So the, the all, like a very popular question uh, that has been already actually answered many times in the conference, but I will try to do it again. So is uh, Don Hina asked like, uh, so 3 Python 3.11 shows a, notif a noticeable performance improvement of 3 Python 3.10, so how much faster uh, we do we expect? Um, well, it depends. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we are measuring, I think, um, I, every time I see this thing, Mark Shannon corrects me because it's actually faster. Uh, so I th we think we expect like 25% on the um, geometric mean of the per by performance test suite, but that doesn't really mean anything towards your application because uh, as you saw yesterday, like it depends on what you're doing. Uh, if you're doing like number crunching, it may change a lot. If you're doing, um, I don't know, like faster, sorry, uh, heavy object-oriented code. So it depends a lot, like, but it will be faster for sure um, in, in most of the cases. And in 3.12, it will be even faster. So um, stay tuned for the announcements of, of 3.11. Uh, like I try as a release manager to always keep those numbers updated. And I'm actually going to probably sit down uh, with, with Mark to just uh, find what is the best way to communicate the improvements because like people like to know a number. Uh, but yeah, f faster. <laughs> How beneficial has it been to have a developer in residence? Are there any plans or desires to look for funding to expand this, like having more folks, uh, asked by Pradyun? Uh, it has been a great success to have Vukash as developer in residence. He's doing a, a ton of work, uh, has, in, has a lot of positive effect, and we would love to have three or more developers in residence. So we are looking for funding. Um, there, there are other aspects of this. Uh, we hired Lukas, he was already a core developer. We didn't explicitly say we needed an existing core developer, but we did have a number of core developers apply. 
even so, so that the pool of core developers who are looking for employment or are willing to move to the Python Software Foundation is fairly small. So there's also the, the thing we have to consider, are we comfortable hiring someone who's not already a core developer to work on, on CPython and how long will it take them to, to get up to speed and all that. Uh, but it is something we're actively looking at and excited about uh, as well in the future. Frank asks us, um, does the Steam Council think that Sam Gross Neville branch will be viable for CPython anytime in the next few years? And if so, does it have a roadmap? Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, we have not discussed this thing uh, in depth. Like, we are excited about the work for sure. Um, so we don't have a Steam Council official um, answer to this thing. But I mean, it's, it's certainly feasible. Unfortunately, we don't have a roadmap. Uh, this means that uh, we are excited about the idea. We have a lot of questions. Um, this, is, this is a very big change in the past. Uh, someone has said that probably if there will be any Python 4 ever, will be something like this. This doesn't mean that it's going to be Python 4. Don't freak out, please. Uh, but um, but it's, a, it's a very big change. And, and therefore, uh, it, you know, it cannot be integrated easily on the core. So someone needs to put a roadmap. And that is going to be very important. It's even more important than the change itself because uh, like even if like it could be a scenario when we are super excited about this thing, but it's, it's, there is no way to, to do it sanely, right? Because it's not only about like um, agreeing with that, it's, it's trying to review those PRs, making sure that user code is not going to be impacted, ensuring that backwards compatibility is preserved as much as we decide to that is preserved, if, if we can everything, if we cannot, which ones. Um, so right now we are lacking a roadmap. Uh, this team council is supportive of the work, I think. Um, for sure, uh, we would like to see a pep and, and discussions, but unfortunately, we don't have any particular roadmap right now. Also, we have been focusing, just as a disclaimer, we have been focusing on all the peps that we have for 3.11 because, as you know, uh, after I release uh, the first beta next week, there cannot be any more peps on 3.11, so we wanted to make sure that everyone that has submitted peps, they have been reviewed by the steering council, so I, every, all, all of our focus has been on that. Uh, so now that we have 311 kind of uh, more or less set up, we can start discussing these kind of things and how can the Steering Council help Sam and the community to advance this work if this is what the community wants. Uh, Bernard asked, uh, what happened to HPI? Any other initiative to address this problem? Uh, now, first of all, I want to say I don't think that's how Bernard usually spells his name. Uh, there are some accents involved. I copied this verbatim out of fairness with all the uh, questions from the Slido, so not my fault. Um, for those who don't know, HPI is an effort to define a C API for C Python and other Python implementations. So you can have efficient extension modules for C Python that already have uh, efficient um, extension modules that will also work well uh, when you recompile them with other Python implementations. Uh, I don't think anything happened to it. It's still going, uh, it's still being developed. It's something that takes a long time and it's also something that takes a long time to adopt because we have a lot of extension modules. Rewriting them is a lot of work. So uh, this is something that's just gonna take uh, a very long time. So Anonymous asks, uh, what does the Steering Council think of the progress of attracting new contributors in general, and specifically for minority groups? Well, we think it's super important. Um, how we are going to achieve this thing? So we, as the Steering Council, uh, have this thing actually as a, as a topic to discuss. Again, we have been focused on the, we started to discuss this thing at the beginning uh, of the year. Uh, we have some ideas, then we have all this uh, mountain of peps that we needed to check, and other, like the, the developer and resident staff, we have migrations. Uh, but this is certainly on the agenda to keep discussing. But also, like many core developers are also like aware of this thing, and, and they agree that it's a very important thing to do. Some of them are actually only mentoring people for minority groups. But we, in general, both the Steering Council and the core dev team, I think we believe that this is extremely important, especially for keeping Python, uh, for ensuring that Python serves all people from different backgrounds and ideas, and, uh, and especially if people that are underrepresented in the community. Uh, we know that we have a lot to do here, by, uh, for sure, uh, but I just want to make you understand that we, we think it's very important and we are working on that. Anonymous asked, any uptick of new contributors post GitHub migration? Any other GitHub improvements planned? I assume this is talking about the GitHub issues migration because we moved to GitHub a number of years ago. 
Um, I think we, we saw an uptick from the original move from Mercurial to Git on GitHub. Uh, it's been two weeks. It's way too early to say anything about a GitHub issues migration. Um, as for further improvements, uh, some people are excited about new workflows, new hooks, new robots to do things for us on GitHub issues. I think we need to figure out more policy around, as the core developer group, not as the steering council, policy around how we deal with new bugs, old bugs, uh, bugs that require more information or that we can't reproduce and that kind of thing, which people are uh, absolutely working well, on. So. Another important thing on this topic is that we kind of, we have migrated to GitHub issues, but we still have some rough corners that we are trying to cut. So there are things that used to work on BPO that don't work exactly the same or that don't work even. So uh, it's been like just two weeks, as Thomas says, since we did the move. So we still, even before adding new stuff, uh, we need to make sure that, you know, everybody, uh, like most workflows keep working and things that, you know, used to work keep working here. So we, we are going to need some time to ensure that, you know, we polish everything and everything works as expected. So in Python, uh, so Bernard asking, uh, so in Python 3.10 we got better messages. Uh, what further improvements can we do to make it even better? Uh, any ideas to steal from other languages? Mm, steal, that's an interesting word. Uh, I, I find this funny, just as a small, a small parenthesis, like every time, like when we start announcing the error messages, like, like an, an enormous amount of people say like, oh, Python is stealing from Rust. Come on, like we are not stealing from Rust. Um, so Rust still has it, so it's not right, I mean, it's great, but like, <laughs> Exactly. So we are like, you know, it, we're not even copying from Rust uh, because there are compiler time errors that are actually easier, right? Well, anyway, like uh, you can expect more for sure. Like we, this is an area that we see that a lot of people really, really like and they find super useful. So we are super happy to keep working on this. But I think um, the, the, the best way you can help us be make better messages is telling us what do you think is a, a, a situation and an existing error that makes your life very difficult, both as a user or if you especially are teaching Python to people that are learning programming for the first time. Uh, knowing those errors um, that are especially tricky or that people struggle with is super important. Like as core developers, we are a bit biased towards like super fancy problems and things that we think is super important and even like we like to just tackle the most difficult things and sometimes we spend a lot of time with things that maybe are not that you know that useful for people so so even if you don't know you know how to even do error messages just opening an issue and say uh, look i teach python every m monday or something like that and you know uh, this thing always takes me an hour to explain to people uh, even if it's a syntax error or if it's not. Uh, that will be super useful for us to know. We may need to tell you that that is not possible, but some of them, and many of them actually, is things that we can tackle or improve in certain ways. So at least tell us um, what do you think we can improve so we can think about it. Uh, Bernard also asked, are the core devs generally happy with the steering council election system? Would any of you like something to change on it? So the Steering Council election system, uh, we uh, elect a new steering council after every major Python release. So after 3.11.0 is released, we'll elect the next steering council, and the entire steering council gets replaced. Uh, now, a lot of us rerun, and a lot of us get reelected, at least you know, the last couple of years. But there's always the risk that the entire steering council gets replaced. Um, up until last year, that wasn't a major concern of mine, because Eva was part of the weekly meetings and could provide continuity. Uh, we kind of lost that right now. I'm not really worried that this entire steering council is going to get booted out, and, but it, in the future that might, you know, it, we don't know what's going to happen. Personally, I would like to see uh, two or three year terms and then uh, overlapping terms, which we've done on the PSF board of directors a couple of years ago, which I think worked out really well. Um, that also allows people to take more risky votes. Um, if they know that there's three people going to be on the board who aren't up for re-election uh, that they approve of, then they can take a risk at uh, a minority candidate uh, for, for the current election. I think that's what would, what would happen, but I, uh, that's just my feeling. And uh, in the end, it's not the steering council who decides these things. It's the core developers, so there needs to be discussion among core developers on all of this. 
Yeah, by design, the Steering Council cannot change the document where it says how the Steering Council works, which makes sense. Uh, so another anonymous, this guy asks a lot of questions. So <laughs> typing and packaging peps have been delegated down to BDFLs. Uh, is this working out well, and will any other was follow? Well, I mean, packaging peps are delegated, right? Like the, the, we have the packaging authority, is that it, how it's called? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, the fact with packaging is it's separate from Python language. They use the PEP system, but the PEPs don't affect Python or C Python. Uh, they only affect the packaging ecosystem. Right, exactly. And typing, I mean, we typing is not fully delegated. Like we have delegated some typing PEPs, but for instance, I think almost all of the ones that I just saw here were decided by the steering council. Especially they touch the syntax. And, and especially the ones that were rejected. Uh, and yeah, yeah and, and a bunch of them that were rejected as well. So I, I think it has been working really well so far. I mean, I don't know that much about the packaging world. I see, I see that some people have some, some restraints maybe, but like so far it has not been like abundantly like a bad idea. Uh, for typing, it has, it has worked really well when we delegated. And this is because like even if the steering council, we are very technical people. Um, we are not experts in typing and uh, typing or other, other areas, right? So it's always good to either like bring people that really know about this stuff or like to delegate if we think it's, it's, uh, we trust a particular person and it's safe to delegate. But uh, this is an interesting topic. Like we, we are thinking about um, how can we leverage better the community and the core developer community to uh, help us because like what happens sometimes is that we have this many peps and we cannot review them all in time. So delegation is something that we are always looking at. Uh, but we are also um, careful to make sure that, you know, decisions that affect more areas than just typing are, um, you know, we, we make sure that the steering council itself ensures that uh, the whole community is represented when the decision is made. Um, so I don't know, the, the answer will be, I think it has been working quite nicely. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, we're pretty much out of time. We had a couple more questions, but eh, it, it was one from my manager. I can answer him directly. Um, so thank you all. Uh, and if you have any more questions, then Pablo and I are around at the conference. I was in one of those pictures. That's kind of cool. Um, all right. Thank you so much to Thomas and Pablo.